All right, cool. Let's go ahead and start this. This is, I think it's call number five already. Uh, this is awesome. So, you know, welcome to the call for uh, better uh, building businesses with elements or what we're doing is every single week we have a group call. These calls are kind of like, like a meetup, like a WordPress meetup. It's a place to come to where we talk and we dig deep into a, a topic and then we open it up. So, you know, everyone has a chance to, uh, uh, to talk, to ask questions, also to just discuss what's going on right now inside the business. It's just a good place for everyone to come to uh, that's basically on the same path of building their business with Elementor. And today, Lauren, she's gonna be running the group and we're gonna be continuing on the topic of how to find clients. And she's gonna give us 15 ways to find new clients, which I'm really excited to hear. So I'm just gonna go ahead and turn it over to Lauren. Sure. Thanks, Jeff. Um, and, and thank everybody. Thank you, everybody, for who's shown up today. I just apologize in advance for background noise, cat noise, dog noise, strange ice cream truck noises. Um, I'm in Indonesia and my electricity at the office went out, so I had to rush back home <laughs> for this call. So I apologize for, for that. Now let me get share my screen. So you can see my keynote. All right, can you see that full screen? Is that correct? Can you confirm, Jeff? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can see. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Just want to make sure. Um, Jeff and I were talking because we were uh, listening to kind of some of the questions and responses in the group of how some people were struggling with finding new clients. And so I know Jeff shared a little bit last week on kind of the, how to get started with finding new clients. And I wanted to share some of my ideas, uh, my ways on um, how we find clients. And just as a little bit of background, I've been doing web design development, specifically WordPress for about 12, 13 years now. Um, and to be completely honest, most of my clients are through referrals. So, um, hold on here, there we go. Just take a note that I'm still learning a lot and experimenting and everything I say today may work for you, it may not work for you. You just kind of take it with a grain of salt where, um, you know, it's just an idea and uh, you can tweak it or evolve it or learn from it as needed. So, the first thing I want to get across is that finding clients is really just marketing. It's marketing yourself. Um, you're, you're presenting yourself as a service and you're presenting yourself as an expert that someone can trust because they're investing their money into you. Um, and there's a lot of competition as we all know. So, you know, finding clients is, is one way, but really it's the big picture is marketing yourself. And, Jeff and I could probably talk about that later where there's like short term marketing, like short range marketing and, and the long game where, you know, there's things you can do right now. There's things that you build yourself as a brand where maybe six, 12, 18 months down the road, you have a better foundation, but really you as your own solopreneur or as a leader of an agency, your main job is to find clients and to, to market yourself. This is not part of my 15 tips, but this is tip number one is um, read, read books. Uh, I've read two of these books so far, Win Without Pitching Manifesto and The One Page Marketing Plan, and I do highly recommend them. Um, it's just, it's a great way to learn from someone who's already an expert, who already has years and years of experience and has polished their own process. Um, so number one is read and keep learning. And then number two, I would say, is keep learning from other people who've been through this process before, like this group, where, where you know, we have some people who are senior in here, where we can help the newer people. Um, I highly recommend the future uh, without an E at the end. They have uh, a lot of free videos on YouTube that are just really powerful, and these were some that I enjoyed um, that helped me kind of create a good plan. So. The very first exercise that I did with the future was creating your list of dream clients. And this was something I had not considered before of just kind of like, who are the people that I actually 
would be really excited to work with. And this is the big clients like Nike, um, McDonald's, Patagonia, you know, those, those big ones, but also the medium and the small ones. And when you create this list, what I noticed, like, I kind of geeked out a little bit. I think we hit like 150, 200, because when I started creating this list, it put me down a rabbit hole of, oh, here's a list of small clients that I would be interested in working with and they actually need my services. And it, it kind of starts to point you in the right direction of um, people you can talk to pretty quickly. Uh, so, you know, it takes anywhere from one to four hours. It's, I, it's very worth it, it's highly recommended. So I know you're probably excited to hear those 15 ideas because we all like little BuzzFeed <laughs> countdown lists. Uh, so I'm just going to jump straight into it of my 15 ideas that can help you find clients. And idea number one is probably one that you would not consider, but it's something that I've learned the hard way. And it's something that I've noticed when people try to sell to me. And that's don't be desperate. Um, people can smell when you're hungry. They can tell when you're just after them for their money. And, you know, it's not... I, I've been there before and I understand that the fear is real that, that we all need to eat and we need to pay people and we need to pay ourselves. But, you know, the clients, they want to work with someone who's confident, who's not living out of fear. They want to work with people that are um, looking forward to the future. So just, it's, it's hard, it's scary, I get that. Um, and, and we can talk more about that of, of how to be confident, but um, it's really kind of that scarcity scarcity based mindset versus abundance based where um, not getting too stuck on the scarcity, not getting too stuck on uh, that fear of not having and focusing on, on the positive. And that will kind of help you not to go into desperation. The number two one, and Jeff and I have talked a lot about this together, is niching. Um, we've mentioned before that there, you know, you can't really niche too far and that no one's really failed from niching. So there's the saying, the jack of all trades, master of none. Um, this is against that. This is becoming an expert in one thing or, you know, a specialist maybe in, in one category. And there's a lot of different ways you can niche. You can niche in terms of your price and your quality. Um, if you want to be the, the, uh, the Lexus and the BMWs of the world, or if you want to be more of the Toyota, more accessible. Um, you can also niche according to industry. This would be like cafes, you know, beauty and fashion, event planning, um, sports and outdoors, you know, whatever is your passion is a really great way to niche down because then each client that you work with is, is more exciting to you because that's, that's the thing that fuels you. Another way you can niche is your geography. If you want to be the best in your city or the cheapest in your community or, you know, the, um, the go-to guy for everything um, in your region, then that's the way that you can focus. The reason why niching is good is that it helps you define your own marketing plan. And I've heard it said, and I, I believe it for myself, that the world doesn't need another generalist web designer or another generalist web developer. There's just so many out there and it's really hard to compete based on, I do everything for everyone everywhere. Um, if you can niche down and pick a geography location, pick a price point, pick a industry, then it actually gives you a, a place of, okay, who are the clients that I'm looking for? How can I get in front of them better? Um, and how can I actually start to offer them value and insights and answers that makes their life better and helps them to trust me more? An example of this is um, at Brave Factor, we work primarily with nonprofits and social enterprises. And that's, that's kind of what fuels us through our day. And when I started this exercise, I, when, it, when we picked that niche, it really started opening up a lot of questions. So it's like, okay, I want this client. Who are they? Where are they? You know, what, what books are they reading? What forums are they going to? When they have a question, who do they turn to? Do they, you know, are they on Cura or Cura? I don't know how to say it. Um, are they on Yahoo Answers? Are they on Reddit? 
what face group, Facebook groups are they in? What Instagram accounts do they follow? And kind of like, even why do they follow that? What are they trying to get out of that content? Why are they consuming that content? Um, and really, what questions do they have? And when I started searching the questions do they have, that put me down a whole rabbit hole that basically just gave me blog posts that wrote themselves. Um, Cause you start getting into like, how can I fundraise? How can I fundraise for a certain event? How can I fundraise for blah, blah, blah. And it, it just really like filled in the blog post ideas, which in turn fills in social media, fills in email content. Um, it, it really helps to market yourself easier when you niche down. It also helps in kind of stalking your competition. So I, I, I do feel like as an agency owner that everyone should know, solopreneur, freelancer or not, that um, you should know who your competition is. You should know if your competition is Wix, then, then you know, how can you position yourself better than Wix if your competition is another boutique agency? Um, how are they marketing themselves? And so, an example of this is what we did was when we niched down, we looked at our geography and we looked at our, our local agencies around us, Googled them and just added ourselves everywhere they were. We went to their lists, we went to their, you know, if they're on Dribble, we're on Dribble. If they're on um, Behance, we're on Behance. If they're on some random tiny Indonesian blog post, we're contacting that Indonesian blog post. We want to show up and be as present as our competition. Um, and then also just if they are advertising a certain way, like how are they connecting to your target audience and how can you learn from them and create your own plan? So that's number two. Number three is to communicate well. And this one's really basic, but it's, it's really important. Um, just answer emails quickly and, and with respect and excitement and, you know, really marketing and, and finding clients just boils down to relationship building. And you'll see that throughout the rest of these tips where um, what you're trying to do is, is be accessible, be available and let the client know that you're there for them. Now, I work in Indonesia and I understand completely the struggle of not being fluent in another language. Um, there are tools. I recommend Hemingway app or Grammarly, you know, just install them and they can help, help you format English a little bit better if that's your struggle. Or, you know, if you need help with, um, a certain response for a client or, you know, even a templated response, you can ask your friends or ask the group like our Elementor group. Uh, the point is that we all have a great community and we can all help each other. And the, the last one is create a template of responses. And this is something I just started doing where, um, you know, just get that automation down. Whatever email you're sending 100 times a week or even 10 times a week, just write it once and then copy and paste it. And this will help make sure that your grammar and your um, spelling is always good as well if you are able to reuse content. Number four seems very basic as well, um, but it's something that I've noticed that is not uh, as apparent, apparent is the right word. It's not, it's not done as much as it should be, uh, and that's make a portfolio. If you are advertising yourself as an Elementor developer, you need to have an Elementor site built because as someone that's hiring you, I wanna see your work and I wanna check and see what you can do. Um, you know, so, so we talked about this a little bit a couple calls ago about, you know, showing off your clients, showing off your best skills. If you don't have good clients that you like yet, just show your concept work. Uh, the whole idea is to see your skills and to see your capabilities. And most importantly, to see your thought process. So there's a lot of resources out there specifically with um, the future on how to create good case studies. And you know, a case study is just kind of like, this was the problem, this was our thought process, these were our insights, and this is how we solved it. Um, as a client, and more importantly, um, these are our results. You know, we helped them get 10% better click rate or you know, increase their target audience size from this to this. Um, 
because beautiful work is important, but what's more important is that you're actually solving people's problems. So show people that, bring them in on your process and help them to understand how you work. And then the last one, I, I feel like I shouldn't have to say, but it is true, is just add your link everywhere. Get it on your LinkedIn, especially. Um, I've seen a lot of people apply to try to work with me or to have me hire them and they don't have, they don't have their portfolio linked. And so it's like, I'm not going to try to dig through Google to figure out your work, make it easy for me as a, as an employer, um, put in your Instagram, put in your email and, you know, just get creative with it and be consistent with that. Number five is to get social. Um, this is getting on Facebook, Instagram, Dribbble, Behance, Reddit. And really the key here is, is just be a real person. Um, you know, thank people, engage with people, comment with real comments. Um, especially on Instagram, you can, if, if you've seen some uh, business or brand comment feeds, you see when people are not listening, it's like, hey, follow me at blah, 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 or hey, if you want quick cash, or, you know, that's, it's all bots, and people are exhausted of that. If you wanna be a real brand and you wanna be a real person connecting with real people, you know, then, then genuinely take the time. Uh, I saw one interview with Gary Vee, and he was saying the reason why he is where he is today, I, I'll post it in the group if I can find it again. Uh, the reason why he is where he is today is because like the first year is he just spent whole eight hour days on Instagram commenting with people, having real discussions with people, and then they would get curious and check him out and start to follow him. Um, he says a lot of people don't realize that, they just see his instant success, but he says he was grinding through getting social on, on um, Facebook and Instagram. So if he can do it, we can. <laughs> and he's a good, you know, a very successful role model that we can live up to. Um, obviously, have a good professional photo of yourself, especially again on LinkedIn. And this includes having um, a solid background uh, or, you know, a very minimal background and a smiling face, kind of not at a weird angle. Um, super basic, but the professional photo really helps. And then also, if, if, like you're applying to work with me, be careful about what you what clients see. <laughs> because I'll dig through your Facebook, I'll dig through your Instagram, I'll, I'll take a look at your life. And um, especially with like trying to hire people full time, if there's things you don't want people to see, you know, try to try to keep your personal life private. Because business is not the same as social. All right, so the next one, I, I pulled LinkedIn out separately from that one. And that's because I feel personally that LinkedIn is very abused. And you can see over on the side, this is just from the past two or three months of requests that I have gotten. Um, I connected with someone and they immediately sent me this request. I don't know who these people are. I don't trust them. I didn't know them 30 seconds ago before we connected. And I, I certainly am not going to invest a lot of money in someone that I have no relationship with. Um, my, I, I'm still learning how to connect on LinkedIn, but just ugh, please, please, please do not sell on your first LinkedIn message. Um, again, it all just comes back to trust. And there's a really, really, interesting visual from the one page marketing plan that has helped it was an aha moment for me it helped me a lot where you have at the bottom here in the red um where it says lead and that's when you have a lead like connecting with someone on linkedin and contact number one through contact number 12 basically just means every time you get in contact with them every email phone call meeting um every interaction with them is a contact point so contact number one, I'm not sure if you can see it, it's very small, 50% of salespeople give up. And this is true with everybody, all of these people on LinkedIn, they never messaged me back. Um, and so I know they're just after my money. They're not interested in me or in my business. They're, they're not interested in, in what, how they can help me succeed. They just wanna help me help sell for themselves. So contact number two, the second time they make contact, 65% of salespeople have given up. By contact number five, 
90% of the salespeople have given up and you have become a factor in your lead's mind. By six, you're nurturing that lead slowly. And by about contact number nine, you have a 90% chance of being called on because you have built that relationship. And I reviewed this with um, my business partner, Chris, and he had a lot of questions about this, like, well, how the heck am I supposed to do nine contacts with somebody? And I, I thought it was a really easy answer, to be honest, because it's like, it's just about developing that relationship. Um, we landed a client. It's one of my dream clients, actually. We landed a client and contact one and two were those first emails and phone call. And then they decided not to go with us. Um, they decided to go with the cheaper guy. So we said, yeah, sure, fine. And we created a product. We sent that product out to them. We created a newsletter list. We asked them if they can uh, join the list and they said yes. We sent them a Merry Christmas note. We sent them a Happy New Year note. Um, you know, even with Corona, we're checking in on our, some of our potential leads with Corona. Hey, you know, this is getting crazy. How are things going over there? It's just relationship building. And it's, it's showing that the client, showing to the client that you care and that you're not necessarily after their money. You're just making sure they're good and making sure that um, their business is, is doing the way they they want it to. Um, especially if you don't get a client, if they do decide to go somewhere else, then you check in again, two, three months later. Hey, I know you picked that other guy. How's that going? And we've done that. And, and the client that I mentioned, my dream client that I mentioned, we did that. And now we're working with them. And I, I can say it was about contact number nine or 10 when they gave us our 50% deposit and we started the website with them. So it takes time. It's, it's not a quick process. Um, and you just have to be patient with yourself and patient with the client. And if you're genuinely interested and if they have, you know, the money to spend on you, then it's worth it because you're creating a real relationship with them. And from that, even if they don't hire you, but you've contacted them 10 times, they might have a referral for you, which I believe goes into the next one. And that's to ask for referrals. And this was a mistake that I did for a long time where I was just hoping for a new client, hoping people would suddenly think, oh yeah, you know who you should contact is Warren. Make it easy for your client, do the thinking for them. So if you're working with realtors and that's your niche, ask your realtor friends, hey, if you know any home builders or realtors that need a portfolio website to show off their projects, they can contact me. You can see that you've already done that thought process for them. Oh, portfolio, got it. Oh, for their new properties. Okay, yeah, I know exactly three people that come to mind. I'll tell them to contact you. Um, yeah, which goes in the next one. Don't be vague, you know, make it easy. And if you don't have clients, and that's kind of what um, Jeff was talking about on the previous phone call is talk to your friends. Uh, you know, get that experience out, get your word of mouth out. And he works with friends. Correct me later, Jeff. I think you work with friends. I don't really work with friends. <laughs> it can get a little bit messy and sometimes the relationship can get damaged um, depending on how it's managed. So that's up to you. Um, I mean, I work with my brother. My brother is part of my company. So they say don't work with friends and family. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> All right, number eight is offer commissions. And I read, I, I tried to Google it and I couldn't find it, but I think it was Forbes. I read one article of a guy in New Jersey, I think. He has a web agency and his only marketing plan is commissions. Um, he just empowers a bunch of different people. Hey, if you bring me a website, I give you 10% commission. And he makes triple figures. I think it's like 500,000 a year. 5 to 15% is normal. Um, I have gone as high as 20% personally, but that's because the relationship was much stronger. Um, but typically it's, it's about 10 to 15%. And the whole idea is just, you know, 10% doesn't hurt you too much. Um, just include 10% higher in the budget. And then you can kind of reward the people that are connecting you. Number nine, and this one's a little bit iffy with Corona going on, but number nine is good. Um, and that's to network and to go to events, uh, go to workshops, go to conferences, offer to teach, offer to speak. The idea is you're easier to remember when you're a face. And when you meet face to face, you create that relationship so much stronger. 
So it's really, really good to get outside of your network and to go to places where your clients will be. If you want to work with startups, go to startup incubators, you know, like do your research and figure out the meetups where, where you want to be. If you want to go to yogas, go, go sign up to all those yoga workshops and yogas, yogis, <laughs> sign up for all those yoga workshops. All right. Number 10, um, which I think maybe Jeff could share more on this one later, because this is not really something that I do. So I don't have very much experience with it, but you can always try to reach out to agencies that might need help. Um, just do a search of people working in your niche or in your area and go meet them and, you know, be unique. Send them a letter, pick up the phone, go out and actually meet them face to face. Um, invite them out to coffee, you know, just being friendly and just doing, doing um, personable things really stands out nowadays. And I wrote in here, email is lost and lazy. And that's true. Uh, especially it's, it's forgotten easily. And you just click send and you don't worry about it again, where actual tangible things and, and meeting people face to face is very valuable. Number 11 is kind of similar and that's find complementary partners. Um, if you do primarily web development, then find people who do design, copywriting, videography, uh, make friends with them and work on projects together or set up a commission-based relationship where if a, a printer you know, needs websites done, then, then maybe you can give them a little bit of a cut and basically just, just reach out and make as many partnerships as you can that you feel good about. Number 12 is something that we're just starting to do um, and it's a lot of work, but this is a long-term uh, marketing strategy and that's to create content and to create value for your target audience. Um, it's medium, it's writing articles, it's creating YouTube videos, it's being part of Facebook groups, it's creating carousels on Instagram, um, articles in LinkedIn, you know, dribble, getting, oh, I misspelled dribble, those triple Bs. Uh, even on, now, if your clients are not on TikTok, don't go on TikTok. But I have seen or heard of, because I'm not on TikTok, I have heard of um, business mentors being on TikTok and doing very quick little business mentorship uh, snippets and they are taking off. So, you know, if, if you want to sell education and that's the market that you want to go down, do it. They're, they're just, your marketing plan can be as creative as you are. Number 13 is to try platforms. Um, I've never had success with this, but I have heard of developers who have, and that's the freelancer, the Upwork, the Fiverr of the world. Um, but my recommendation for this is don't just depend completely on putting yourself on Upwork and Fiverr and calling it good. Uh, marketing and getting clients takes that knocking on doors, going out and meeting people, going out and creating those relationships. Um, sitting around and waiting for people to find you is much, much more difficult and much more hopeful. Um, oh shoot, I forgot the quote. Uh, oh, the, I heard one quote was, um, getting lucky through referrals and people finding you is not a marketing plan. It's just kind of reactive <laughs> to, to the things happening around you. It's good. Getting referrals is great, but it's not necessarily a marketing plan. Um, so yeah, put yourself on it, you know, advertise yourself, but always try other things too. Number 14 is just be unique, find different ways to make yourself stand out. Um, and this is something that we try to do with our clients and it surprises them and they, they love it. Uh, HubSpot calls it delight where what you're offering to your clients is delight. And that's what makes you stand out from your com competitors. Um, so we do things like thank you cards at the end of a project, you know, for new year's, we send gifts to people. And this is usually like some branded stuff, some notebooks, um, maybe a little toy or something. Really, whatever you can think of be unique. And I had a friend who would even, um, he was trying to get really, really big projects in. When he sent, he would print out his proposals. He'd send his proposals with like a little notebook and pen so that they could take notes. Things like that, you know, it's like, that's memorable and that's unique. 
and nobody else is doing that for sure. So, you know, if you really start to figure out your dream clients and you want to go after them, figure out ways to connect better with them. And number 15 is be consistent. It's kind of like that um, one page marketing plan book where it takes 10 contacts with a person to get the lead, to get the, get the project. So, you know, I know it's difficult. I know it's a lot of work and I know it can get very discouraging. Um, we did a marketing, we did some marketing efforts six months ago and we're just starting to see some results from it. And it just, it takes time and that's okay. And just keep being consistent, whatever you feel comfortable doing, just keep doing that. Um, and yeah, actually that's, that's kind of the end of my slides. So I will stop sharing here and we can kind of just open it up for discussion. Um, if anybody has any questions or ideas or things that have worked for you that you would love to share, <laughs> add to the list, or if there's things that haven't worked for you, um, we can talk through why that is and, and what we could do differently. So yeah, the floor is everybody's. Cool, thanks Lauren, that was awesome. Sure. I got quite a bit on that one. Got a full page. <laughs> <laughs> trying to be more eco-conscious right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll let someone go ahead and start off with some questions. I know I got quite a few things in here. Got a lot of notes. Okay, can I ask some question? Can you can you hear me? Yeah, absolutely. What's up, Minju? Uh, so like one of your uh suggestion was find a agency that might need a help. Like, mm -hmm. and you have an agency, and Jeffrey has an agency, right? Mm -hmm. And then like I also was thinking about if I can have an agency that which goes to me that like kind of like regular job not too much work but just like maybe two three hours to practice some work like mm. like if, like complete the jobs like to practice my skill and then my also the half of time i i just like do my own client to make more money would be actually for me the ideal case because i'm a still beginner of the wordpress i'm learning a lot mm -hmm. so when you find those people who you want to work with as a agency owner agency ceo what do you what kind of aspect do you usually consider to like to see that people through the yeah to work with them yeah or where do you find usually or what do you what do you think that the most important thing for you that's to a pick great that person that's a great question um i gotta think back on the the developer how i found him hold on I know for designers, I will speak for designers first. That one, I have to see a portfolio or I have yeah. to see Gribble or Behance. Um, yeah. What I look for in a designer is unique patterns. So if it looks too repetitive, I know it's kind of copy and paste. Um, I and I, I think Jeff probably could speak more towards the technical side of things. Mm -hmm. uh, I look for, in a web designer, uh, I look at to see how strong the UI is, especially because I'm really, really picky. Like padding, if padding is consistent, especially in a button, if it's consistent with the button, it's not completely centered. If things are not centered, it's just like really basic um, kind of design, design knowledge that I mm -hmm. view as being important. So if mm -hmm. I see those things and they look really good and the page looks very like structurally sound, that's number one for me. Then I'll test the page to see if it's responsive um, mm -hmm. and see how it reacts. Mm -hmm. And then typically I'll put the page into um, like Pingdom or GT Metrics and see a little bit more mm -hmm. of the technical side. Now I don't mm -hmm. really open up the code and look at the code mm -hmm. because WordPress is so like, you're not coding mm -hmm. from scratch. So it's, mm -hmm. I don't really compare that. Mm -hmm. uh, but if it looks structurally sound, that's what I look for in designer or developer and now, where how yeah. do you how do you find them like where do you meet them 
Sorry, that you find do, no, 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 that's okay. It's a lot. Um, how do I find them? I found my first developer in LinkedIn. Um, I was searching WordPress developer in Bali. And so I would go through their portfolio through LinkedIn, see if it yeah. was good, and I contacted him directly. Yeah. Um, if someone else contacts me, again, it just goes back to looking at the portfolio. We've started to do some like simple development tests or we test, you know, like do a very small project to test. Mm -hmm. um, because what's important to me as an agency owner is making sure that the design matches with the development mm -hmm. and making sure that it's responsive and, and fast and, and clean. Um, Jeff, I hope that helps a little bit. Jeff? Uh, well, first, I, I like to look at the work. You know, I need to like make sure the skill level is there. And mm -hmm. a lot of those things I look at too, like I, I can tell you right now, one of the things that will make me turn away from someone's work are the obvious errors in the work. If I take a look at someone's website and I usually look at it on my phone first, if mm -hmm. I take a look at it and like there's just an obvious error, like text is all aligned to the left and over here it's centered and the menu is over here, just stuff that just really stands out that I see right away. That tells mm -hmm. me that there's no uh, attention to detail. So mm -hmm. it's really important to have attention to detail, whether they're a designer or a developer, because mm -hmm. the developer needs to follow the design. Like that, that's crucial right there, that they could follow the design to detail. Uh, second one, if the quality is there, I see there's good work, and it doesn't have to be perfect. To me, like first the skill level has to be there, but the second one is about attitude. When I actually talk to the person, like I gotta see if there's communication and if, if they're open-minded, if they're like uh, teachable. To me, mm -hmm. being teachable is huge because uh, when I work with someone, I don't wanna just work with someone for one quick job. I wanna build an ongoing relationship with. Mm -hmm. you know, for me, it's an investment. Mm -hmm. My time, sharing my sure. experience, like sitting down, I'm investing mm -hmm. in that person and I really want to build something with them. And it's one of the reasons why I be, you know, went the agency route is because I wanted to work with others, you know, give more opportunities and things like that. So mm -hmm. I think those are like the two biggest things I look at, you know, mm -hmm. first one skill level has to be their attention to detail, mm -hmm. not perfect. Just being able to like show attention to detail is, yeah. is attitude mm -hmm. being teachable. And I'll and, add to that too with the, mm -hmm. the soft skills where it's um, asking questions, mm -hmm. especially early on, asking good questions where, um, and that's what I try to do with my clients too. We try to have like an honesty policy, like, hey, I just, I'm a bit confused with what you're saying. I, I don't understand. Can we like reframe this and, and can I ask you some stupid questions? Mm -hmm. And um, the clients always appreciate it when I do that because mm -hmm. it, it kind of like opens up the door for like, and that's, that's something that I struggled with with some of my designers and developers that I worked with in the past was they wouldn't, they would just assume and they wouldn't ask questions maybe because they I were see. scared. And so then they would give me the work and I'm like, this is not like, why did you ask me like those, oh, I should have asked you that. Yeah, 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 you should have. Um, and then I will say too, uh, for applying with this is just a general note that I, I thought of while we were chatting. I'm sorry, there's loud children outside. I don't have any children, but they're all in my front yard. Um, <laughs> um, regardless, if you're a designer or a developer, have a solid resume, have a solid CV, and mm -hmm. totally cheat. There's Canva. You just go in there and plug in your information. Like, like if you're giving me a Word document, you know, I barely let developers get away with that. But if a designer gives me a Word document, it's just like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. Yeah, and um, you gotta make that first impression really good on the get-go. I see. And Jeffrey, also, where do you find those people, your, your workers? <laughs> where do I find them? Uh, yeah. It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. Yeah, honestly, <laughs> it is actually hard, you know, to like to find find a developer to work with. And that just shows right there that there's so much opportunity. 
out there mm. and to like really look at what is what our agency is looking for like what to look at is what are what are agencies what are the problems and the difficulties and challenges and how can mm-hmm. you offer a solution to those challenges mm. one of them you know being consistency one of them you know not having a portfolio you know so you know if you're looking for one that's when you like you know really go out put time into building your portfolio put mm-hmm. time into building Behance. I, I can tell you, I, I'm really like blown away when I see a really good Behance, when I see Facebook is all clean, when I just see a lot of work is being put in, I know it's somebody serious. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I, I've, I've had uh, people I've worked with, I've, I've hired off of Upwork. Mm-hmm. Uh, my experience with hiring off of Upwork has been, I lost a lot of money. Yeah. Because I've had to redo a lot of work myself. Yeah. Uh, but when I do find that one good person or team, I stick. Yeah. Uh, and I think most of my developers come through word of mouth. So I'll have a developer friend and he has friends or he has a community that he, oh, Lauren, I've worked with this person or, you know, we were sitting in a workshop together and I know this person. But is- even then, you know, like, I don't even know the percentage of how many developers we still work with because it's <laughs> low. <laughs> It's, it gets down to those basic things of do you communicate? Are you hitting the deadlines? Even if you don't hit the deadlines, yeah. communicate that you're gonna miss this. Like, let me know beforehand so I can communicate to the client. Yeah, yeah. And, um, let me know where the problems are and if you have questions. That There's just like so many little basic things that um, mm. even, even right now, like we're trying to interview people, they miss their interview, no one shows up. They don't email me back. They take a week to email me back. I'm I'm already over it by then. Like, <laughs> I want to see that you're hungry and that you're you're open and eager and um, you're willing to uh, work hard. I think. Yeah, I see. Thanks for answering both of you guys as a owner of the uh, agencies. <laughs> Still, well, lots of opportunity out there. There's so much yeah. opportunity in this field. One of the reasons why I got into web development originally, it was about four or five years ago when I started, I chose it because I saw the statistics. I mean, the numbers said there was like, at that time, 55% of the jobs in the entire industry were not filled yet. And they did not have enough people to meet the demand. I see. And honestly, (laughs) yeah, it makes my job easier and probably Jeff's job easier too, because there are, um, so many inefficient, ineffective, incompetent developers where clients come frustrated. Like my developer doesn't contact, like I contact them. They don't get back to me. It mm. makes it really easy to do well at this job if you yeah. just treat them well and communicate well and, and treat them with respect. So real quick, I want... I want to bring up something that that I actually just go into something you brought up, Lauren, and it was one of uh, your methods on on one of your uh, techniques on finding new clients. And one was to work with other agencies, whether it's white labeling or just reaching out to work with other agencies. And I have to let you guys know right now that that uh, I'm currently working on marketing plans. And, you know, part of my plans is working and finding our own clients. But another part is also doing some white labeling and looking for bigger agencies because there's a lot of opportunity out there. Uh, I get I get messages like Lauren does all the time in my LinkedIn and in my email and through my contact forms, through my website. I do not pay attention to those. Uh, it's building that connection and talking to people. And I really think that that is going to be the key right there uh, to get, and this is part of my, my, uh, uh, my, my strategy as well, because I don't want to be that. And that that's always been like my, my thing that's holding me back is, you know, I don't want to be just sending out mass messages, copy and paste and be looked at that. And I don't want my brand to look like that. You know, I had the opportunity not too, not too long back. I met with a LinkedIn marketer and, you know, I really considered it because I knew he could bring me in a lot of business. I knew it. He had the numbers to back it up. I would pay him a thousand dollars a month and he would bring me in lots of leads. But 
at, at the cost of him sending out 20,000 messages a month. And like, I, like something sat wrong with it because I want my brand to be unique. I want us to stand out. I want us to be the kind of brand that really cares for people. So what I'm finding is working is building connections, talking, and just like reaching out, you know, uh, when you see like, just, just start sparking up conversations, use posting stuff, just start commenting on there and then send messages like, Hey, I really like the content you're, you're putting out there. Good stuff. You know, keep it up. I really look forward to reading more of it and, and just keep talking and interacting with them. And soon they're going to start interacting with you. And that's when you start to like, just have a call. Uh, right now I'm doing something where I, I was given a, I was given a, a task. Like right now I'm also working with the business coach and he's helping me out with a lot of stuff. And he gave me a task for this month, which is to reach out to 20 people, not talk about working with them, but just to learn about them. That's it. Just to, just to get used to just talking with people and like getting to understand them and learn about them. So I really think if you're looking to like white label or to work with other agencies, uh, that, that approach is the way to go right there. Cause that's what will make me start to have the, the, that's what would make you stand out to me is if you contacted me and just start saying, Hey, I, that article was dope. I really liked it. I'm like, cool. Thanks. You know, and all of a sudden now we're talking and now I get to know you. And now if we're thinking about working together, I know what you could do. We got opportunity to go up. Uh, now we're looking at, uh, I would, I would, choose to work with somebody who's doing that over a cold email or just going on Upwork and trying to hire someone and rolling the dice. Um, the future group, Jeff actually did that where they were doing a, a marble challenge. I think it was 10 marbles per week. So every new contact you contact, you move your marble into another jar, from one jar to another jar. So it was like, you have to move all your 10 marbles over every week. And it was like a little challenge to really force yourself to prioritize contacting those new clients and getting outside of your comfort zone, but doing it in a way that's authentic and genuine and creating those relationships, not mass spamming, emailing. Definitely. And being authentic and genuine is what I think really comes from. And from what you hit from the very beginning, you know, if you, if you're hungry and you're desperate, people sense it, it's unattractive. And it's not just in this, it's not just with sales. It's in general. I mean, you know, I like I, when I was in grade school, if I was trying to get a girlfriend, but I was like desperate for a girlfriend, I wouldn't get a girlfriend. But as soon as I got a girlfriend, that's when I became attractive. You know, it's like, it's just, it's just the way human nature is. We could, we could sense that kind of stuff. But if you genuinely care, if you really just want to get to know someone because you want to get to know them, because you want to like build connections, if you really just want to help people in this industry, you're going to do very well. And it all comes from right here. You know, this is where it comes from. We could sense when somebody is just spamming and just wants to take money. And then we could also sense if somebody really cares. Anyone else have any other questions or topics they want to discuss? Uh, hello, team. How are you all? Nice to see you again. Um, so first of all, I missed the earlier part of the call. I was just setting up the Zoom and everything, but it's nice to be back again. Um, first thing I want to start for all the people who are a part of this call today. And uh, that is that I was a part of the initial two calls and it is a valuable place for me to be. And I hope whoever is here today is getting the most out of it, right? Um, and adding on to what Jeff and uh, Lauren were saying, I think I don't own an agency yet. I'm just working as a freelancer, but I feel that coming on from a freelancer as well, uh, networking and communication uh, to Minju and whoever asked this question and are in this call. I feel that networking is the most important. Yes, your design skills and things like that will come in the picture, but you need to communicate with people in a way that, you know, you can pass on a message that you are here to not only work, but you are actually here to work on your skills. I mean, you know, as a web developer and designer, there is always a scope for improvement. So I don't think so. Your design is the perfect, but 
if you have a design and you are willing to communicate to people on how you are working on it, I think it does the job right there, you know, uh, to Minju because she asked that question. I think communication plays the most important role because um, I just started in this uh, web designing like few months back and I have had like a bunch of clients now, four or five clients I've worked with. But the ideology is to keep communicating with the present clients and also build up your networking to other people so that you can reach out like freelancer and Upwork, I think is a good place, but that doesn't work out for me because people are selling themselves short there. They are making websites for $50 and I don't know what they are making, but yes, they are, right? But for me, I think if you have got that spark of working and communicating, you can charge more as per your skills, but it's more about trusting people and making people trust you that you are there for them, you know? Um, like, for example, if you have a new client, start off with a uh, um, contract. So I want to say because I just sent my first contract to a client, thanks to Jeff and the team at Elementor, I was able to do with the help of everybody because uh, I didn't do it and I wanted some uh, guidance on it. And Jeff, to tell you, brother, it went really well. Your guidance and the whole group's guidance went well. And it was a three page contract. The client was like, oh, it's a little big. But when I walked through him over the phone call, he was pretty okay that, okay, it looks good. Everything is nice, you know, and it's going well, it's in the process. So I think if you put yourself out there and there is a, a like six, 700 members of people in this group, I'm sure someone or the other will come forward to help you out. If you are ready to network, I think people are ready to network with you. and. I really appreciate Jeff and Lauren and because uh, I was really nervous when I had to make my first contract. I was like, oh, what do I need to put in? It's, it's, this is not me. And But believe me, it came out much better than I could have thought of. And I give uh, these credits to the whole community who has put in some thoughts, you know, Lauren and Jeff. So I think there is always a answer for a question if you are looking for but you should know how to put that question across and how to move forward with it. So yeah, this, this sounds out to be very useful. <laughs> oh, that's that's I, me. Thank you. Yeah. I, I think Jeff was very, Jeffrey was very busy last week because I asked the exactly the same thing from Jeffrey that like it showed me the example contract because it was the first contract for me too last week. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, yeah, he gave me the room. Video. You should just post it, I think, to show to other people, Jeffrey, that that <laughs> that video. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Thank you for your tip. And then communication part, I think I'm kind of good because I've been trans I've been freelancing translation mm -hmm. doing like for three years right now. So my communication yeah. is actually way better than most of the other other uh, freelancers. I really like mm -hmm. because translation part is really really fast communication than other fields. But mm -hmm. yeah, and but thank you for your advice. Advice, and then I think, yeah, I think we are on the kind of similar page right now of our career path, and I wish we can see our like different in like six six months that we are like grow way more than like no nervous with the contract anymore, like those things. Yeah. Yes. Uh, one thing I feel, and uh, mm -hmm. I think it's a very useful tip. Even if you do not have work, um, I was not a part of the last call, but I did see the recording of the last call. Mm -hmm. um, my, my suggestion is do not sell yourself for free because I see a lot of people doing that. And yeah. I think the discussion happened on the last call. I saw the video last night to be a part of this call apparently. Like yeah. <laughs> my suggestion is, I hope you were there. I'm not sure, but don't sell yourself for free because if you are not valuing your own time, I don't think so. The customers are going to value your time. So. Even if you don't have work, don't sell yourself for free. Charge less. This is how I started. Like I started with like a 300, 400, 500 dollar mark for a website. But slowly, when you start building, your referrals will work and your work will show. Mm -hmm. If you want to work for free, make a website for yourself out of nowhere. You know, mm -hmm. rather than working for customers. So this is the best tip I give to everyone. And don't sell yourself for free. Otherwise you are killing yourself. You know, you are making yourself vulnerable. That's it. How Fiverr people, how, how people working on the Fiverr can make a website with the five, like, like $50. Uh, that's uh, just 
like you just made me that kind of question in my head anyway thank uh, you yeah, thank you for your tips <laughs> yes see the i think minju they do work for 50 dollars but that work has to be redone again with 400 dollars so it's additional cost yeah, anyway yeah. so you yeah. see where it's going right so yeah. yes okay thank you for your tips yes that's all right well, Rajah, this is good to see you back, mate. It's always awesome to have you yeah. here. And your energy is always welcome here. And happy Holly. Yes, thank you. Happy Holly. See my hands? It's still purple. Yeah, man. <laughs> That's dope. That's dope. You know, when it comes to, like, going for fever or going in another direction, uh, I wrote this note down right here while I was going through it because, you know, like, we all have – different goals and we all have you know like I don't want to knock anybody for what they choose to do you know all I know is what I what I choose to do with myself but you know whatever you choose to do I think it all starts with uh the very beginning building your persona so if you're new if you are on Fiverr you're on Upwork or you're still like struggling like how do I get clients where do I go what do I do how do I do this you know you can start off with building your own persona, figuring out what do you want to do? You know, what, what is your goal? Like in one or two years, where do you want to be at inside this career right here? Do you want to stay, you know, like on the upward platform or do you want to start working with bigger clients? Do you want to have an agency? And after you could build that persona and you could figure out who you want to be, then you could all, then you could go ahead and look at who do you want to serve? And how can you serve them? How can you take care of them? And, you know, it's up to you. That, that's the a, that's a, that's a great thing about this is like, you know, it's up to you what you put into it, what you want to be and what you want to put out there. And it all comes down to value. How much value are you wanting? Are you willing to give? Uh, I'm going to jump in. Yeah, that's yeah go true um ellie has a question and is going to jump on they're asking if we've ever faced problem selling a client a website built by elementor convincing them that elementor is an awesome page builder so my question to ellie is have you faced had problems <laughs> faced obstacles with a client um complaining about elementor yes. hi <laughs> Uh, <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, kind of. I mean, like, you normally, uh, for clients with a budget, then, you know, we, we try to sell them a WordPress website, you know, built with Elements. So, I think we, it has this, like, awesome customizable features. But then, it's, at times, because, you know, to them, they would feel that, oh, it's a pitch builder. So, you know, it's it got to be cheaper, you know, et, et cetera, things like that. And apart from that, it's more like, um, even though we were to go through the entire process of, like, you know, revamping their existing website or creating a new one, um, they might, uh, they will start to explore and realize that, oh, you know, it's actually pretty easy. And, you know, in future, I could just do it myself. Yeah, things like that. So I'm just wondering if any of you have you know, faced any problems to convince them that you know, yeah, it's doable still with uh, Elemental and that you know, yeah, feel free to come back to me for any future revamp. You know, if, like you really love my service. As in some of my clients, they did uh, refer you know, other clients to me. But I think like the return rate is actually pretty low because in the up, they realized that they could actually you know, do things themselves and stuff like that. Yeah. Yep. That makes sense. Um, I think it all depends on the client, right? So if we go back to what we're selling is not Elementor websites or even websites. What we're selling are solutions to someone's business problem. Um, and the way that we do that is through our skills, which happens to be web design and development. Um, for us, I actually did have a client that was not interested at all in WordPress, let alone Elementor. They had issues, uh, uh, two clients actually. One client just hates Elementor. They like something else and I'm like, you guys don't understand how to use Elementor because <laughs> they were complaining about things that I'm like, no, 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 it's not like that. Um, but one specifically, they did not want their website to be on Elementor. And so it was a process of, of working through with them why that was, why they felt that way. Um, and they just wanted a plain HTML, CSS website. Now, as at that point, I was still freelancer, 
So as a freelancer, you know, it goes back to having those connections. Um, you can still sell the project if you, if you know people that can help you outside of WordPress and you just work with that person and, and manage it and you can still make money with them. Um, but I think that just goes back to like, just kind of why, why, why do they have those issues and what, um, why do they feel like Elementor is not going to help them with their business problems? Uh, typically I'll just sell it as like, we like to work with Elementor because it's a really easy page builder that makes it faster to build pages later. And if you don't want us to continue to help you, you can always do it on your own because it's a very visual thing. You just click edit and save. Um, and then they'll pay us for a little bit of training and then they'll do it on their own. So it, it's, it's kind of like you've got to work with the client and question them through their thought process and help them feel more comfortable with your solution. If they ne don't feel comfortable, then you just got to find another path, I would say. Jeff, do you want to add anything or anybody else want to add anything? I really don't get technical with the clients too much about, you know, I really don't bring up Elementor. Uh, when I, because it's, it's the tool I use, you know, like I feel, uh, my, my goal is I want the clients to focus on their business and not the technical aspects of the website, because that's what they hired me for. You know, they hired me because I'm the professional and the expert inside the area. And when I do like break it down, I, I don't really like say we're using elements or page builder. I tell them we're using a newer technology now that makes it easier for you to update your website. Uh, it's newer than the older websites, the way they were built. You're gonna really love it because you could edit it in almost like you're editing a PDF and then we'll do the training on it. Maybe I get more technical clients because they ask me specifically, <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> what are you using? But we, we do include it. We say we're using Elementor WordPress in our proposals. Um, and we include it up front so that they kind of understand what they're investing their money towards. So it's probably, you know, up to you with what you want to, because there are clients, you're right, Jeff, where they just don't have any idea about anything and you don't want to scare them away. Uh, I want to add something on this on what Jeff and uh, Lauren said. Um, um, to LA, LA asked that question. Can you hear me guys or no? You can? Okay. Uh, so my experience is of this, till the time uh, the needs of the customers are getting sorted, right? Uh, a person wants a website, you deliver a website, they don't need to get into the technicality as Jeff said, unless until they ask you, you know, how are you going to do things? You can just keep it simple. We are going to do this. And uh, this is the breakdown. This is your scope of work. And uh, this is the cost of the plugins because everyone knows WordPress needs plugin. Now this plugin can be Elementor, could be uh, Divi, whatever you are using. It's about your choices, right? But if the person specifically comes and he has a little bit of knowledge saying that, oh, you work with Elementor and I can do that. And, you know, it's easy. Then probably everyone can do that you know but not everybody is in this field right now to do it because as easy as it looks elementor but you still need to you know set it up in a way that you know that you are aware about elementor you see there are a lot of wordpress users but not everybody is aware about elementor or using it similarly there are a lot of people using elementor but they are not using uh, for example, a theme like Ocean WP or Astra, where you have templates, you know. So not everybody, it's not about the awareness, what everyone is aware of. So I think till the time there are questions put on you, my, my personal opinion says that we can keep it simple for everyone. Like, you know, you need a website, I give a website, these are the charges, this is how we do. But if it starts getting into a bit of uh, nitty gritties here and there, then probably you can tell them that, yes, we are going to use WordPress and uh, it is the most used software anyway right now. You can give them some statistics why people use WordPress and not Wix and other people and it kind of sorts problem up. I mean, thankfully, as of now, out of my last few projects, I didn't face this concern. I just told them that, you know, I'm using certain plugins which are uh, chargeable. These are the material cost and it gets over there. But if they specifically request a HTML, CSS website and uh, they stringently watch it, then probably you need to reach out to them.
more people as Lawrence said you know you you do need to make because if you are a designer and not into coding and everywhere then probably you need to make some connects over there but for me I think customers do not really get into that much nitty-gritty they need a website to get a website that's the end of most of the stories but sometimes you never know <laughs> yeah that's it so I'm gonna add just one more thing to this uh you know, like after you have experience developing sites and have that time behind you, you know, you start to see Elementor might not be the solution to every single website. So some websites should not have Elementor working on it. You should go more custom or, you know, you know, ACF or, you know, maybe even Shopify. I don't know, but that's up to the developer, you know, uh, to try to choose the right tools. So... You know, just something to also keep in mind. If you really feel Elementor is the right tool for a project, then, you know, that's, that's your uh, expertise on it. Uh, Jeff, I have a question just on that, as you said. Um, out of the, this is just a rough analysis question because I have developed like five to seven websites. So this is my experience and I have used Elementor on them. Out of the, websites you have built and maybe Lauren can answer that as you you know personally individually you not you as an agency but you as a person um, how many percentage of websites you think you use Elementor for or uh, how useful this tool was to really build up your business because you are in a group of building business with Elementor so how useful was it for you how much percentage of websites you could make Using Elementor as a base, yes, ACF will come in and some other plugins will come in, you know. Um, but what is the percentage of website you were able to make keeping Elementor as a base? Just so that we have an idea that, yes, it's not like you cannot use it everywhere or you can. So before Elementor, we're using WP Bakery for most okay. projects. Yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. I, you guys know how fun that is right there, WP Bakery. Yeah. <laughs> and it, like our our jobs are about, I would say 66% uh, WordPress, 33% uh, Shopify. We do a lot of okay. e-commerce and I've done mm -hmm. personally a lot of e-commerce as well. Mm -hmm. I, but a majority, I would say just a high majority, maybe out of our WordPress websites, about 80% of them, maybe uh -huh. 90%. Uh -huh. uh, were with WP Bakery. So when I okay. switched over about two years ago to Elementor, mm -hmm. um, it was just, you know, just it, it helped us out to speed up our workflow. It also opened up the possibilities of what we could do. Because mm -hmm. when we're using themes in WP Bakery, we're limited. Mm -hmm. You know, or would have to spend tons of time to like add a feature or add something. So I would say right now, even myself or my agency, I would probably say about 75% of the sites that we built are with Elementor. Uh -huh. and That's I, a good I, number. And I prefer Elementor. Like, yeah. I look, I, I personally, I like that. It's fun to me. You know, like, I get sometimes some very big projects that, have, that has the customizations. They're not always fun to me. You know, I, I like the Elementor sites. I found, like, it works well with my workflow, with my niche, and with, you know, what I'm trying to do. Yeah, sounds good. That answers the question. So this is it. Then you can use Elementor for most of your work unless until it's a very big custom stuff you are doing. So yeah, makes sense. Thank you for that. Yeah, I'm the same as Jeff too, where we went from what WP Bakery to Elementor. And I mean, I can't say for Jeff, we're not sponsored by anybody at all. So <laughs> we're not making any money for our recommendations here. Um, I think the, the thing about our field, and this is for everybody, is that it's going to get easier and easier to build websites where everybody can do this. You just go in and click and add your content. Um, and that gets it harder to justify spending money on it when any five-year-old can hold it, go in and build a website. Um, so it's one, I would say find whatever system works best for you, like Jeff said, that automates your workflow because as a developer, we're doing the same work again and again and again and again. Whatever you can do to make that shorter, you'll make more money and you'll have more time to do other things. Um, 
for me, for us, Elementor is that. And we've tried WP Bakery um, and we've tried Divi and we tried, um, oh my gosh, I'm, not, I'm blanking on the name. Uh, Jeff, who is it? It's the new one. It's the new one that the future loves. Bracey, Bracey. No, not that one. It's not WordPress. It's not WordPress at all. Um, oh, Webflow. Webflow. We tried Webflow. Webflow. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And a lot of developers love, or designers love Webflow. Um, but just for us, for the type of websites we're building where someone is spending money and wanting an expert to make it, Elementor has been best and fastest and most stable for us. Um, so, so we do custom work too. I would say probably like Jeff, it's like 75, 80% is Elementor, 20% is custom. Mm -hmm. You could definitely build your entire business off of elements or websites. Most definitely. It doesn't, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's the tools are always going to get better. I mean, the way I look at it is like, look at just industry, you know, regular industry, like manufacturing, they're constantly getting better uh, manufacturing equipment that streamlines the flow that enables them to get out more, uh, products faster and they're not lowering their prices when they do that you know they're just they're they're streamlining and they're building up their business on it I really think like that's how uh, designers and developers that that use Elementor need to look at their business as well because I, I really feel myself included there was something in there that that you know that that was in in my mind thinking like if I'm building a website half in half the time, maybe I shouldn't charge as much. Or when I'm starting to uh, quote a project and I'm quoting it and I'm thinking, oh, it's only going to, if I use Elementor, it's only going to take me five days to build it. Maybe I should only charge, you know, a thousand dollars for this. And really it's the wrong way to think. It's not, it's not business minded. And at the end of the day, it comes down to what you're providing is that website going to solve your business problems? Is it going to help their business out? You know, I know like anyone could use it right now, but can you make a website professional achieve the client's goals with it? It doesn't matter the tool. The tool just helps us with our process. And this is a little bit off topic of what the topic is, but with what Jeff said, where it's like, do you charge less for getting something done faster? Absolutely not. Because, um, if that's the theory, the slowest worker is the richest person. <laughs> and, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean your clients are happy either. <laughs> Jeff is muted. He's talking, but he's muted. Uh, <laughs> where if you're experienced and you're able to get something done faster, you're worth more than the slowest worker. And if you're, if the client's happy within five days when it would take another person a month, yeah, that's, you know, three weeks saved for you and, and, through save for that client as well, you know? So there, there's value in that. All right, cool. So we've actually been trying to keep the calls brought down to about an hour <laughs> and it's gone on to, I mean, I love it. I could sit and talk all day, you know, I just geeking out. That's why I love like hanging out with other designers and developers, but uh, definitely want to like respect everyone's time as well. Cause you know, maybe, People got personal time or got to work. So maybe we should bring it to a close. But first, you know, open it up for any last questions. If anybody has anything before we end uh, the call that they want to uh, go ahead and bring out. I feel like I'm just the buzzkill right now. <laughs> just party's over people <laughs> i'm not good at goodbyes like and that's just in you know in general i'm just not good at goodbyes i could drag out a goodbye as long as you know well look at i'm <laughs> hey thank you lauren <laughs> uh lauren thank you it was a great great topic and i i got quite a few things out of this one right here uh it's it's just you know these things when we talk about it, always look at it from a different perspective. One of the things I got is about niching, but we could talk about that some other time. But light bulbs started going on, you know. Uh, I'm really glad to see uh, the others here. And I, I'm glad to see already the B 
the value that's coming out, like it's helping, it's helping. And you know, that, that was my whole vision for this. You know, my whole vision was to build something that's going to help people. And, you know, like I, I didn't have this when I was new and I'm glad to see that we could provide something where, you know, we're just here to help each other just to talk. And if anyone is new to uh, these groups or these calls, you know, these calls, they're, they're just for, for other designers, developers, other uh, elementary users, or anyone looking to start their business to have a, a place where we could come to and we could learn together, no matter at what level you're at. We're all at different levels, but we all can learn from each other. And, uh, you know, I look forward to the next week's call. And if anybody has any comments, any ideas, any suggestions, post them inside the group. You know, the, everything right now is still new. I'm learning from this group. I'm listening to everyone inside this group. So I'm listening, you know, we're listening. And th this is for the group. All right, so with that, uh, if anyone has any last things, we'll just go ahead and wrap it up and say that hard goodbye. Uh, yes, um, the only thing is, as I say always, whenever I'm a part, um, I am grateful to the whole community and uh, Jeff and Jeff and Lauren as well for hosting these calls and coming every week. Like I was absent for last two weeks, but you know, you guys are doing some hardcore karma yoga there for the people. So thank you. And we are grateful. That's it. <laughs> you're here in spirit, man. We felt your energy still wherever you're at. <laughs> I'm always there, ever omnipresent, you know, maybe not physically, but omnipresent, yeah. <laughs> for sure, for sure. <laughs> All right, cool. So let's go ahead and wrap this up. Next week, uh, we might have a whole different topic. I'm not sure what yet. If you guys have any ideas, go ahead and like, you know, post it, leave them in the comments, or you can hit me up too. Uh, anybody wants to reach out to me, go ahead and reach out to me. I'll always get back to everybody. And uh, yeah, with that, let's go ahead and end this. Cool. Thank you, everyone. All Thanks right. for joining. Thank you. Namaste. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. See you soon, people. <laughs>